Greetings and welcome to Decolonizing Real Estate Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Lindsay Gary. Powered by Gumbo the Podcast, Decolonizing Real Estate Podcast explores the colonial roots of real estate in the Western world. Roots that have historically led to the displacement of Black and Indigenous peoples and hinder their access to land. It does this while acknowledging that although there is an obvious need for land and property, it presents a cultural conundrum as the Western philosophies around land differ greatly from those in traditional African culture. Sitting alongside these ideas, this podcast ultimately speaks candidly about these topics while also working to increase real estate access for African people in this country and abroad from a decolonized and Afrocentric approach. On today's episode, which I'm very excited about, we'll be discussing reclaiming agricultural land. And our guest today will be sharing her knowledge on this topic and the work she's doing around agriculture and how it relates to real estate. We're joined by an amazing guest, Ms. Ashley Pellerin James, and she's a native Houstonian and currently serves as the interim program leader for the Agriculture and Natural Resources Unit of Prairie View a and University Cooperative Extension Program. Through her 11 and a half, come on, 11 and a half year career in extension, she found her passion to help educate limited resource and historically underserved landowners on ways to improve their agricultural enterprises and be good stewards to the land. Ashley received her BS in animal science from Tuskegee University and her MS in agricultural science from Tennessee State University, the other other Mm TSU. She is currently a PhD student, soon to be Dr. Ashley James at Texas A&M University in the College of Agricultural Leadership, Education and Communication. So thank you so much for being on the show. I'm so excited to have you on and let's jump into the conversation. So first off, come on, bio. Hey, you know, it's a little, a little song, a little song. <laughs> and I know we've been talking about this particular episode for like almost a year now. So I'm really excited that you're here to share um, your immense knowledge, all the work um, you've been doing around this for so many years. Like that's you OG Loki. You a young OG. You know what I'm saying? And uh, I'm really, really excited for you to talk to our audience about the importance of our people, right? Especially gaining knowledge around agricultural land and how we can use that not only to benefit our, ourselves and our families, but also how to do right by the land. We don't have to. My thing is we don't always have to engage in real estate in a way that's negative to the environment or negative to our communities. We can create ways to do that in a sustainable and um, supportive way um, to our community. So tell us a little bit more about what you do, the work you do. (laughs) So the work that I do, the the passion of my heart, as I like to call it, is um, within the realm of agriculture, um, as you mentioned, my background was in animal science, but through that work, I found a way to, to uh, I was like, I, I want kind of more people interaction, even though I have an animal science degree. So uh, I kind of fell into the world of agricultural education and not necessarily being a, a, a teacher of youth, but a teacher of adults. And um, I really kind of enjoy that watching people um, continue to, to come back to the land. So through extension, I was able to work in Tyler, Texas and Houston, um, I work with just landowners in general, whether they own rural land and just like sprawling land or whether they had a couple of acres or whether it was just a a backyard garden. Um, You know, my idea is land management and land conservation is for everybody. You know, whether you own just kind of a square in your backyard or uh, your porch, you know, land conservation is uh, important and it's important to understand why we need to preserve the land. you know, it's good for, for real estate use for homes, but then also with home ownership comes land ownership. So that's one thing that is important to me is to um, make sure that those who have rural agricultural land, uh, whether you live in Houston and own it or whether you're actually working and tilling the land for um, an income or for a hobby, that we are being responsible stewards of that. So my whole job is with agricultural education, um, educating the masses. So in addition to that, just at this point, I've, um, since May, I've been able to 
kind of take the lead in overseeing extension agents who are housed in different counties across the state to be able to help. And um, with our particular extension agency, we are part of the 1890 Land Grant University, Prairie View A&M University. And we actually have a federal mandate to assist with educating limited resource, historically underserved or vulnerable populations. Um, my area specifically in the area of agriculture, but we also have agents who work in family and community health, um, uh, family and community health, 4-H and youth development, community and economic development. So we have four units. Okay, before we get, okay now with uh, before we get into that, I wanna ask, I wanna backtrack a little bit. Sure. So, because you've said a lot, and so some of our listeners may not be as familiar with the terminologies. So I just want to make sure we clarify and kind of go through those things. So when you talk about preserving the land, what does that actually mean? Um, so when I talk about preserving the land, it is uh, managing natural resources in a way that um, will ensure its perpetuity or just ensure that future generations have access to those natural resources. Um, we all have heard the term or may or may not have heard the term urban sprawl, which is kind of the spread of these urban cities. Uh, we know Houston is expanding. We know Dallas, Fort Worth, Austin. A lot of these um, cities are expanding. And with that expansion, we are losing not only agricultural land, but also natural resources. And we um, potentially divert natural resources away from um, areas that may need help. So we're, we're experiencing flooding, we're experiencing, you know, um, climate change, and all of these things uh, could, be could be attributed to um, just kind of a decrease in natural resource availability. So it's my, you know, kind of my passion to ensure that, you know, future generations have nature. Wow. Okay. Now that's, I'm going to come back to the other things you were getting at, but I want to talk about that a little bit because I think um, we've talked about this in previous episodes, how so many of our um, ancestors worked land, right? And so right. that land being everything from, you know, uh, working on a plantation in during slavery to working on a plantation after slavery, sharecropping for a lot of our ancestors or people, you know, people that are not even enough, far enough back to call it answers and maybe just grandparents, depending on your age um, and where you're from. But then also going back to ancient times where, you know, back in Africa, a lot of our cultures were built around uh, agricultural uh, civilizations, right? And that's how they were able to grow into uh, nations and empires, kingdoms and things of that nature. So lately we've been seeing that a lot of our millennials and gen z population even gen x have been wanting to return to these roots in more right. ways than one right pun intended <laughs> right <laughs> so why do you think that is right why do you think we see we're seeing this kind of shift back to people who, at least finding interest if not necessarily moving to these areas but finding interest in um the places that our ancestors dwelled um I think that necessity breeds uh, innovation, and sometimes that innovation could be in the form of returning to what we know or what we feel we've lost. So I think kind of in the current climate, a lot of people have been doing a lot of soul searching, kind of a lot of historical research into their families, into um, what was done previously, not necessarily giving into the stigma of agriculture or the stereotype that was previously associated with that, I think um, it's taken some time, but we've got we've kind of circled back to that stigma of agriculture is not ne not any longer a uh, something to be kind of down looked down upon, but more of a badge of honor. And I think we finally come full circle with that, and I'm just I'm thrilled to see it. Yeah, and it's and it's funny you bring up this point about it being full circle because you know I grew up you know in Houston. In the city, I ain't a city girl, but I grew up in the city. Yeah. And, <laughs> you know, and but I grew up going to the country all the time because my I was very connected with, you know, my grandparents, 
aunts, uncles, and cousins who didn't live in the city. So we were always out in the country, whether that was Port Arthur or Louisiana, which is really the same thing geographically. And I remember being like dreading working on my grandpa's garden, my grandpa's garden. I remember loving the outdoors, like loving to being out there, but just actually doing the work of the gardening and the farming was a lot and it was hot. And um, now I wish I would have paid more attention to what my grandpa was trying to teach us. You know, he had a huge garden and he used to have a farm before that. But at the time we were kids, he had a huge garden, everything growing in there, okra, to everything. And mm -hmm. even my grandma who lived in Houston, she had, she was also originally from the country, had um, a garden of flowers, a flower garden, you know? And we were always helping, but it was just, it just felt like a chore. So we didn't really take it as seriously, even though I loved the idea of it. So I'm glad to see that so many of us are recognizing the value, the the cultural aspects, and the fact that it's about our survival as well. Um, you know, and not looking at it as this backwards thing that I think a lot of people have tried to make us feel. There was a post on social media that I saw a few years ago. Can't think of the family's name, but the family posted a black family, young black family with a lot of kids. Mm -hmm. posted a picture, a photo shoot of them eating watermelon. Did you see that? I kind of remember that and was like, well, okay. <laughs> and I remember they got a lot. For, I thought it was cute. I thought, and I really thought it was beyond cute. It was really beautiful because they have oh, a I'm beautiful probably thinking picture. of a different, I'm probably okay. thinking of a different picture. Because they have a, okay. they're, they're individually beautiful. Like the okay. wife is beautiful, the husband is beautiful, the children are just gorgeous chocolate black family beautiful right okay and they posted this picture of them like these outfits matching outfits eating watermelon on the porch and they got a lot of pushback because people were like how would you give into that negative stereotype and i really loved keandra that's her name on instagram uh -huh. and i think her daughters are nixon they just came to me and i really loved it because she was like educating them she was like wait a minute i'm from texas Part one, my family ended generational poverty by selling watermelon. That's right. This is, we had watermelon farms and this is how we were able to get into being a six figure earning family. That's right. Independent of Everything working to, under the white person stuff. Now let's talk about how healthy a watermelon is. It's healthy. Like yeah. it's a fruit. It, right? it is water. The water that people don't want to drink out of them fancy bottles because they're like, oh, drinking gallons of water a day is ridiculous. You can get that by eating fruit. Fruit. And <laughs> it's an, and on top of this, what I love the most, it's an African crop. It's an African fruit. Meaning our ancestors brought the seeds from Africa to here, to America and planted them. So it just when she and she I don't know if she mentioned the part about Africa but she mentioned the other things and I thought it was so powerful because she was like y'all can't tell me that this is bad but because that's just an example of how we've been made to feel bad about yeah. where we come from yeah and I mean even in my job um you know I've I've heard out of people's mouths you know why are you working in agriculture it's a return to slavery and I was like so feeding feeding ourselves is a return to it's a return to like people really said that to you. I will not mention who said it, but it was said, and I'm just mm -hmm. like you know, and it was it was somebody of African American descent. Like why would you, why would you as another black person, you know, try to convince me that feeding you is tied to slavery? Wow. Everybody has to eat. Right. You know, feeding and sustaining ourselves is a natural part of life, not a part of slavery. The servitude was the right. slavery part. The crop was just a, a, a sidebar. Right. They were growing it anyway. They just, just got tired of working it. Yes. So and I'm, let's and ahead. let's talk about and yeah, let's talk about how you hit a, you hit the nail on the head because for one, a lot of the the the. The flag she got was from other black people on social media. But part two is that we, our ancestors were enslaved for reasons. 
right? It was it was of course race related, right? Racist, right. racism was a huge part of it. But we had skills, we had expertise, supreme knowledge of many things, especially the land. So many Europeans didn't have that because in this, they didn't know how to work this part of this type of climate, this type of uh, environment. Mm -hmm. So they go to Africa and get expert agriculturalists. This is a skill. This is not just, oh, I'm going to go plant some stuff in my garden. Like this is a real deal. This is the real deal. And they particularly enslaved particular groups for that reason. So this is something we should be proud of. We have to recognize the slavery part, like you mentioned, that's a very small amount of our history, which we shouldn't ignore, right? right. But it's a very okay. small amount of our history. History, but We have to understand we were doing this before that. Absolutely. And we were so damn good at it. We we built a whole nation <laughs> off of it. That's right. We built multiple nations. Like, multiple, many. I'm about to say many. In my father's house, there are many mansions. We built oh. multiple nations. I'm just saying. <laughs> but yeah, so I, I I take pride in it. And I'm like you. I'm, I was born and raised in Houston, but I didn't necessarily go out to my family's farm. We have mm -hmm. land. I went out there maybe once. Mm -hmm. So I don't even have any like familial ties to agriculture. My dad's a mechanic. My mom's a pharmacist. My grandparents were teachers and a barber. You know, they lived in rural land, but they didn't, you know, once they left, and that's kind of the story of a lot of people when I was right. doing my research, just kind of the the role that the Great Migration played into us um, having a knowledge gap uh, as it relates to agricultural right. land, land conservation, land preservation, because a lot of the things that were taught to us as far as how to care and manage the land and grow for agricultural purposes, not just crops, but also livestock. A lot of that is generationally passed down. That's why some of these other larger farms, some of the white farms, they don't have succession problems. They don't have a lot of the problems um, that we have to the extent they have the problem. They just don't have it to the extent that we had because um, in an effort to go find a better life, you know, women in the research that I saw, the, the women left and went with their husbands to go, you know, be in more urban cities where there was more of a financial standing, where they could have a little bit more um, security, financial security. Um, and then the sons were left to, to kind of work the land. But if they couldn't work the land, go off, go to school. Um, and a lot of times they didn't return back. You know, mm -hmm. they, they didn't come back and they didn't bring their children back because they had whatever kind of memory. You know, they right. had their traumas kind of prevent the next generation from loving, you know, something that's, that, that's so dear to us. Right. So I think that's part of the return and kind of with my graduate school work, I, I call it kind of closing the knowledge gap on agricultural education and land preservation. Because what you just, said. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Finish your thought. No, I was just saying just because um, you live in an urban place doesn't exclude you from uh having the knowledge to care for the land. Right. Now no. talk more about that, please. But um, what you said gave me chills. That's all I was gonna say. Oh. It like it's so powerful what you're doing, seriously, because we don't know this is very spiritual. Like this is it's more than just like I'm gonna take care, like I'm gonna buy land and like build a farm or right. create a farm. Like right. this is spiritual, like being connected to the earth, being connected to nature, like that's powerful, you know, and yeah. just thinking about that's the same earth our ancestors walk like it just really, I don't know, something about what you said just really struck something very deep. And I think it's important that we, that I circle back to that yeah. um, <laughs> because it's so, so powerful. So I really appreciate you. Now, now what were you, can you go back to the point you were making? Uh, I forgot my point. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, we'll <laughs> <laughs> no problem. So let's start off with, so can you tell me about land grants and and how those relates, how those relate to HBTUs? Right. So um, with the land grants, so there are two types of land grant systems within uh, the United States. There's the 1862 land grant universities, and then there's the 1890 land grant universities. 1862 uh 
institutions were established with the signing of the Morrill Act. And basically, that's why you have A&M schools, so agriculture and mechanical schools. Um, those schools were supposed to be uh, for sons of toil uh, to provide opportunities for them to get higher education. Um, those schools had to include uh, military as well as agricultural studies. So then in uh, 1890, Morrill also recognized that slaves were also considered sons of toil. Um, he mentioned, you know, we, we freed a bunch of these slaves, but we haven't given them any kind of tools to progress themselves. So, we, you know, we have all these free slaves, but, you know, what are we doing to assist them? So he kind of took a novel approach, um, kind of got some bipartisan. It took some time, but got some uh, bipartisan uh, work and was able to get the 1890 land grant, uh, 1890 institutions established through the signing of the Second Moral Act. And what that did was that established uh, schools for uh, African-Americans or freed slaves or former slaves to be able to go to school. Um, part of the stipulation was that um, the 1862s either had to accept black students or they had to support and provide land for um, black students to be self uh, train. So that's why some of your land grant universities, all land grant universities are HBCUs, but not all HBCUs are land grant universities. And if you notice, a lot of these land grant universities, Prairie View A&M, Langston, Southern, FAMU, all of these schools, some of these schools were started before 1890. So all they did was take that money and um, allocate it to those schools. So we are federally funded to um, provide assistance. And um, so through the extension program as a land grant university um, that was developed and fed through 1862 and 1890. So Texas A&M has an extension service and we work in tandem with them. We share county offices um, and Texas A&M, because they are the larger school, they are in all 256 counties within the state. Uh, Prairie View is growing for the first time ever. We have received our state match, so it is long overdue. We are thankful to those who um, helped rally for us um, at the Capitol to ensure that we had equal access to funding to be able to uh, provide additional assistance to more people across the state of Texas, limited resource um, farmers, ranchers, and families and landowners across the state of Texas. Um, so we are really excited about that. So we are continuing yes. to make progress. That's awesome. And I was going to say, first of all, I had no idea. Like I knew about PV, AMU. Yeah. I knew right. about Texas A&M, right? Growing up here, Southern FAMU. Like I know about these schools, but I never understood. I knew like what A&M stood for, right? Like, a, you know, a, you know, I understood the, the, the letters, but I didn't right. understand the history. I never knew the history behind how those came to be. So that's really cool. So the fact that those things have been around for so long. And so what what's beautiful, I, I remember going to PV ooh, maybe about 10 years ago and I was doing some political organizing activity there. But I remember getting a tour and it was through the agricultural department. I was like, oh my God, who are all these like black farmers? <laughs> like, right. It, at university, I had never seen that like in person because I didn't go to PV. I'm not from the area. So I didn't, well, I'm from Houston, but I'm not from that immediate area around PV. So I was blown away and I'm like, oh my God, there are pigs here. Like, you know, and I've seen, <laughs> <laughs> I've seen those things, obviously, like growing up, going to farms and stuff, but never seen it in a, a black university setting, which I thought was so amazing because they were talking about just how important it is to get into the field. And so when you talk about this extension, basically what that means is you're going out into the community, right? Into communities outside of the university? Yes. So um, none of our, well, I won't say none of our work, but a majority of our work, I would say about 90% of our work is done out in the community. Um, and it is to make sure that uh, the, the information and the research being done at the university is spread to all those um you know, across the state. So, uh, you know, that we want to make sure that that information gets out. Information not shared is information lost. So we want to make sure that the 
good work that we're doing uh, at Prairie View. Though we have really high level work being done, we really have some uh, great foundational work that can really help improve agricultural systems, land conservation, and just um, practices in general, even associated with your health. So we want to ensure that that's not trapped at a university level. Ooh, that's powerful. <laughs> yeah. That's why I love yeah, my work. I love my work. Now, and look, and the work loves you. And we love yeah. that you're doing this work, okay? So I know your goal is to help you know, underserved, historically underserved. So a lot of our black landowners um, find ways to become good stewards of the land, right? But also to find ways to get to do agricultural enterprises. So what I know part of a large part of what you're doing is through education, like teaching people about it. So what are some ways, like tangible ways that people can begin this process? So if, for example, you have land, that you know is in your family, how do you go about getting that land? How do you do the research? Or if you don't have the land yet, how do you go about purchasing it? How do you make take those steps to actually acquire the land and to then know how to keep it up? All right. I, I want to know for myself too. <laughs> so I will say this, that each one of those is a separate discussion. So the person who already owns the land, what we'll do is we'll get them tied up with um, or, or tied into resources that are available to them, such as um, NRCS, the Natural Resources Conservation Service, which can help you build a management plan. They can help you look up the topography of your land to know, you know, this is where a pond should go or these are where your natural water resources are. You know, you may qualify for some conservation uh, cost share programs or they may help you identify areas where you have um, wetland and then you can apply for a wetland conservation area. And that may be worthy of a, like a tax exemption. Um, you have the um, FSA, the Farm Service Agency, which is the financial arm of the uh, USDA, the United States Department of Agriculture. And if you're looking for financial assistance, well, they have things called micro loans, which help you start your enterprise. If you're looking to just kind of get started and they, you know, they go upwards of, you know, thousands of dollars in, um, in assistance or in loans. Um, and there may be some grant opportunities through there. So making sure you understand where your resources are, the Texas A&M Forest Service, that is um, your, if you have forestry or timberland, um, a lot of people who suffer with heirs property also just have a lot of timber because it's kind of a set it, set it and forget it type of operation. But timber management, true timber management really takes a plan. So getting you hooked up with those resources that can um, not just have you have a set it and forget it operation, but one that is um, concerned that, that thinks about the conservation of the land, but that can also help you pay those taxes. You know, where are your write-offs that you're missing? So those are the things that we can get you in touch with. If you don't have your land already, when we get the people who are like, hey, I'm thinking about getting it, what we ask them to do is research the area that they're looking at and, and understand what they want to do long-term. Okay, you want this land. Do you eventually want a homestead there? Or do you just want to have this land to lease out? Do you want to have, um, you know, what activities do you want there? Because then that can help you talk to a realtor about what your plans are and they can get you in touch with, hey, this this land could be good for this. Uh, and then you work with extension and the timber service to say, okay, here's the problems with this land. Maybe it's going to cost you a lot of money to clear it, but these are the potential. This is the potential that you can have. So, um, you know, and if you're if it's tied up in heirs property, you know, uh, talking to extension and, and getting in touch with people who can help you talk to lawyers. Sometimes we have some funding that's available where we can pay for an hour or so of, of uh, some legal help. Um, so at Prairie View, we have the um, we are part of the SFLR network, the Sustainable Forestry and uh, African American Land Retention Network. That is a multi-state, multi-organizational um, um, network of groups that are really focused on um, building education, building generational wealth through timberland management. Prairie View has a forester on staff to help with that as well. So um, again, a long answer, but each one of those requires something different. So we don't want anybody to come in thinking that there's one set way to do something. We, mm -hmm. we will work with you through whatever situation you have. I'm blown away. 
<laughs> because well, don't don't blow too far, girl. Come on back. Look, look, let's stay here. <laughs> but because it's so much, like and it's and it's amazing all these resources that are out there. And I think well, I know that this is by design that a lot of us aren't aware. Um, because it, it's, you know it's free. Your tax money pays for it. That's how we've ended up in situations like the Pigford Act. And right now we're actually um, about to mm. close out the the discrimination um, the, and, you know, the, with the Natural Resources Conservation Service um, and getting people kind of rectifying some wrongs that were done. And it's because yeah. there was a lack of uh, one. If they did know about it, it was it was tough. And then if they didn't know about it, they weren't going to tell you about it. Right. So now we need to close that knowledge gap. Again, closing that knowledge gap is not about truly just working the land. It's about understanding land management. Right. And and understanding what you also have um, access to. Because like you said, we are paying. These are our yeah. tax dollars that we don't even know that our money is going towards it and that we can have so many write-offs and benefits. Um, and I'm also thinking about for those who you talk about those who want to get land or those who may already have it, how to reclaim it. And I'm also thinking about um, what, what about people who are in the urban areas? Cause I know we talked about there are still ways to, you know, treat the land right, right in the urban area. So what are some tips you have for those people who are living in the big cities? Who are living in the big cities and own rural land or who just living in the big cities and just may have some, you know, front yard land. Cause, both those are okay so um but, ma but mainly the part about the front yard right so those who have um you know just front yard you may have um container gardens windsill win uh, window sh window sill gardens um you too can be uh preservers of the land making sure you get soil tests before you just go out and put out fertilizer a lot of times we go to lowe's we go to home depot and we just put out fertilizer whatever's there um, sometimes our soil doesn't need that. You know, there's, there's, you know, it's a whole science and a chemistry that's in your soil, in your grass, you know, your, whether you have St. Augustine or Bahia or whatever you have, um, or centipede grass, there is a microcosm that's underneath all of that, that needs to work in harmony. So understanding that even your little patch of grass kind of plays into land conservation, because if everything is working right, you get those roots right. Um, that allows for when we have rain for that water to soak in there and not necessarily flood our streets. You know, we are we are cemented in. So any type of green space that we have available, we want to make sure that we preserve that, you know, um, and we want to make sure that we're, we're taking the best care of it that we can. Yes, for aesthetic reasons, but also for, you know, just to do our part. Woo, my mind, I'm just <laughs> because it's like, yes. Yeah. Okay. And also made me think about a friend of mine who's also um, been reclaiming her agricultural land. Her uh, uh, grandfather's family has a big farm with, as well with livestock, the the farmland, the the um, husbandry as well. Let me say it like that. Right. And I remember she brought something to my attention. She was like, "We got to be careful of even cutting our grass because you'd be surprised." the herbs and the things that are just there. Cause we don't mm -hmm. even realize that there are different types of grass. Like when you said right. that, the Ox, you know, for this and that, like some of that stuff is good for us. Yeah. Sometimes we need it to be a little tall because yeah. it has benefits, but we're yeah. still thinking we're, a lot of us have been trained to think about it only aesthetically. So we don't understand those deeper benefits. Yeah. And I just thought about that. I'm like, yeah. So from the livestock side, we definitely, you know, I deal with goats. So, you know, that was my thing. We want the grass to be at least four inches tall because in the bottom three inches are parasites. So the goats will pick up those parasites and it can be, you know, costly, deadly. We have to kind of treat them. So um, in agricultural practices, you don't want that grass to be dull. We kind of have it where we call it a rotation. You want that grass to grow up and to be able to um, get the nutrition and the benefits and to grow to a certain height where it can be nutritious for the animal, but then also right. preserve 
the land underneath it. You don't want those roots disturbed. Um, because one thing that you don't think about, a lot of the reason we talk about no-till, low-till, is to not dis um, disturb that topsoil. It takes years, and I mean like decades, 30, 30 plus years to rebuild topsoil that we have damaged and pulled up due to um, urbanization, due to you know just pulling up things. The natural topsoil is really the house for a lot of key organisms um, that kind of make everything work. And also when you till it up, there's a thing called a seed bank. All of those, you know, when you, you're like, oh, I just planted this pretty grass. Well, where did those weeds come from? It's in that seed bank that's underneath. They may have been smothered out, but given the opportunity to grow, those weeds are going to pop up. Mm. So, you know, there's, there's things that we don't think about in the soil that um, through this work, you know, I, I've been able to kind of be like, oh, let me. You know, I understand the urban part of it, being a Houstonian, you know, understanding the convenience of living in urban areas, but also knowing that it's my, I have a part to play in it, even if I just have a front yard or a backyard. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I hope you all listening deeply because this is so, so, so critically important for our communities. Now, I want to ask you, as we begin to wrap up, how can we reclaim? What else? Is there anything else we can do or that you're doing that you haven't mentioned yet that we can uh, to, to reclaim agricultural land? I would say first have productive family conversations. Mm -hmm. A lot of times agricultural land, especially in black families, is caught mm -hmm. up in heirs property and it's caught up in meaningless arguments. Um, I would say learn to have you know, productive meetings. And that doesn't mean that that's not going to be without discourse. It's not going to be without arguing, whatever. But at the end of every meeting, what's your action item? What's the next step? And not being afraid to include young people in seeing that discourse. Because if you want them to have it next and preserve it, they either need to see what they want to avoid. You know, they had this conversation before and here was the outcome. So we don't have to rehash that. We've, we've gone past that and this is where we are. Um, and then also just kind of um, making sure you understand your uh, legal options, you know, uh, mm -hmm. making sure you have a lawyer and one that may have a background in agriculture. If you have, um, you know, no offense to the ones here in Houston, but <laughs> You know, they won't necessarily deal with land law in the same way that a, a rural lawyer would do so. So um, make sure you understand the people in your community, even if you don't live on the place, because um, your neighbors may be your best friend. If you only have 10 acres of timber, they're not going to come out for 10 acres, but your neighbor has 150. Well, when they come in and cut that, they can come cut your 10. You can get your cut off of it and you've you've helped clear the way. So um, making sure we kind of have that cooperative, you know, since we're close to Christmas, Kwanzaa, all of that, that cooperative, um, you know, aspect economic thing, cooperative economics. Definitely. There was, look, I know you got it, but, um, but yeah, so productive converse, family conversations and um, I would say knowing your resources. That's one thing that I'm really big on and that uh, I'm doing some grant work now with the graduate school that will help kind of kick off some educational programming for uh, Houston dwelling uh, rural landowners to introduce them to the people they need to know. FSA, what can they do for you? NRCS, what can they do for you? Timber, what can they do for you? Lawyers. And sometimes I may not be able to, you know, pay for your lawyer, but I can save you some money by telling, ask, telling saying, hey, this is what you need to ask your lawyer. Right. Don't waste time telling stories. Sometimes the story is good, but a lot of times if you have an hour and you're paying $250 an hour, condense the story. Get, get to, to the, the point. point. Condense the story, get to the and, point. And I would say be careful too um, of predators, especially for people yes. who have family lands, who have certain, whether that's mineral or water, air rights or whatever they have access to as a family. Be careful of people, these companies who try to buy or at least them from you. Like know your rights, um, know what you should be getting and know that you should talk to a professional. Um, I would also rec recommend you talk to um, a, a real estate agent 
who is actually versed in this field because every real estate agent doesn't know about agriculture, doesn't know about buying land. They may not know how to sell you a house, but what about the land that's under it? They may not even, of course, in real estate school, we learn about these things, right? But are they well versed in it? Right, because whoever owns the topsoil may not own the water. It may be right. somebody different that owns the minerals. And so you want to make sure that, you know, what are you, one, if you're purchasing land, what are you actually getting? You right. know, and if you're selling your land, because sometimes the option for people, the best option is to sell. But maybe you want to hold on to your mineral rights. Maybe you want to hold on to your water rights. So um, making sure you consider all of those things. Um, and even when you're leasing land, when you're talking to realtors about leasing land, um, a lot of people lease their land for deer deer hunting, especially in November. Mm -hmm. Very right. lucrative, um, very good. You don't, you know, it's kind of a set it and forget it thing, but they're liabilities. So you want to make sure that mm -hmm. you're talking to somebody, making sure your contracts are, are in place. Um, you know, so there's a lot of things that you just should be careful of. And we have lease templates for that. Mm. So, so there are a lot of free resources that I want your listeners to be aware of. Where do we need to go? Whose website do we need to go to? The Cooperative <laughs> Extension Program at Prairie View a and University. So, um, yeah. So on so, that note, on that yeah. note, I'm going to ask you to share these links in a second. Okay. Do you have any final thoughts outside of what you've just shared that you want to reiterate? Um, or I, share I, new? Well, I mean, I, I always reiterate that productive family conversations are important. Um, and I think they're number one if we're talking about succession planning. Um, mm -hmm. Keeping the youth involved um, when we're talking about succession planning and then knowing your resources. Okay. Um a lot of times even growing up in Houston, learning all these things in school, I was like, man, I, I probably could have done so much more if I just would have known right. more. So mm -hmm. um, always being one to want to know and learn. Don't ever feel like you have enough knowledge. Um, question, question everything. Um, you know, double check your resources. You wouldn't go to a doctor and you, you were kind of unsure about them. You would go get right. a second opinion. Same thing with land ownership, land management. You get a second opinion. There are, with, with extension, whether you go to the Texas A&M or Prairie Review, we are only to hand out um, research-based information. Now, Pookie and them may have something next door. And they may <laughs> tell you something, and it might work. But from us, you will only get research-based information just because we want to keep it unbiased. And we want to make sure that the information that you're getting is um, reputable. Right. So come, come to extension. Um, as Lindsay mentioned before, you want to make sure that you're doing the right thing the right way. There may be multiple ways to do it, but, you know, we're going to tell you in a way that is relatable to you um, and that hopefully makes sense. We have a wealth of resources. And if we don't know, it's our job to find out. So come on and ask exactly. us anything. Well, I want to thank you so much soon to be Dr. Ashley Pellerin James for being such a phenomenal guest. This is invaluable information and very, I've, I've seen very few black women um, doing this work. Now, I'm sure you, I'm sure you've seen more because you're in the field, but it's beautiful to see a young black woman who is so passionate about it and willing to share this knowledge for our community. So thank you. So please Go ahead and share any events or activities you have coming up and how listeners can connect with you and with um, the organization that you work with. All right. So if you want to um, get in touch with us at the Cooperative Extension Program, um, you'll just go to www.pvamu.edu slash C-A-F-N-R slash extension. And CAFNR, C-A-F-N-R is our college agriculture food and uh natural resources we just had a name change so i'm trying to make sure i get it together but again that's www.pvamu.edu slash kaffner slash extension um you can also and on there you'll just go to extension and you can look for us in agriculture and natural resources and just click on our name and if you need to get in touch with an agent that's near your county or within your county just give us a call and we'll be able to get you in touch with your local agent. Um, 
and we'll be able to get you in touch with those other resources that we talked about. Um, upcoming events we have, we have two major events coming up. We have the um, Women in Ag Conference, which will take place at Prairie View a and University on uh, February 23rd. That's a Friday from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. It's completely free. Registration will roll out at the beginning of the year. Um, also, we have our annual uh, Ag Field Day, which is uh, hosted by the College of Ag, Food, and Nut Natural Resources at Prairie View. And um, it's just a day of fun. The first day is a youth day. That's April 20, April 19th. And that day is where students come and they kind of get to interact with our researchers and spend a half a day with us. The next day, Saturday, April 20th, is our family fun day. That's kind of where we have a producer day. You'll get topics on agriculture, food and nutrition, natural resources, medicinal plants. You get to interact with our researchers. We have some fun activities for kids as well. And that is an all day program and also a great area for you to meet those resources that we discussed. So we look forward to seeing you hopefully at our and uh, registration for that will roll out at the beginning of the year as well in January. So our um, and you can find all of that on our website through the extension program. I'm trying to be there. I don't know about y'all, oh. but I'm over here like, come on. Yes, women. And agriculture. Listen, and both of those are free. Both of those are free. So your tax dollars are uh, hard at work uh, <laughs> to give you this information. So come on and visit us. Lunch is included in both programs. I love it. And listen, I'm going I'm to restart that last part. I know because <laughs> I saw your light go out. I was like, what's happening with you next? <laughs> <laughs> These lights. But anyway, thank you so much for sharing that. I definitely plan on being in the place to be, especially hey, this women. <laughs> This Women in Ag Agriculture one. Thank you so much for sharing. You could bring the whole family out. So thank you again. And be sure to connect with Decolonizing Real Estate Podcast. You can check us out on gumbothepodcast.com. Our Instagram is at gumbothepodcast. And you can also, uh, if you're looking for a realtor here in Houston or in the state of Texas, you can find me on Instagram at Realtor Lens. And I hope you enjoyed your bowl.